I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Big hour. Let's get right to it. Alec Murdoch from the Murdoch family in South Carolina, the low country. This guy, a disgraced attorney, accused of the murder of his wife and his son and a whole list of other charges, including money laundering, drugs, you name it. He's charged with it. For those of you not familiar with this story, Chanley Painter has more tonight. Richard Ellen Murdoch, if that is your name, please raise your right hand. Do you wait reading of the indictments? Yes, sir. 13 months after the deaths of his wife Maggie and son Paul, 64-year-old Alec Murdoch stood handcuffed inside the Colleton County Courthouse and was formally arraigned on two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a deadly weapon in the commission of a violent crime. What say you, Richard Alec Murdoch, are you guilty or not guilty of the felonies wherein you stand and die? Not guilty. How shall you be tried? By God, my country. Richard Alec Murdoch was born and raised in South Carolina's Low Country. He met his wife Maggie at the University of South Carolina, where she was a member of Kappa Delta Sorority. They married in 1993. The next year, Alec graduated from law school. In 1996, Maggie gave birth to their first son, Buster. Paul was born three years later. Photos on Maggie's Facebook page show that Paul was an avid hunter and outdoorsman. It was Monday, June 7th, 2021, when Maggie and Paul Murdoch were found brutally shot behind this outbuilding on this sprawling 1,700-acre Murdoch property. Alec Murdoch told police he arrived after 9 p.m., found the bodies, and called 911. Hey, emergency. <laughs> this is Alec Murdoch at 4147 Moselle Road. I need the police to pass us immediately. My wife and child just got badly. It was just after 10 p.m. when Alec Murdoch made his 911 call. It was raining. It took first responders almost 20 minutes to arrive at the remote location. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Police documents show that less than a minute after the crime scene was secured, responding officers requested that the coroner be notified. According to the indictment, Maggie Murdoch was shot with a rifle and Paul Murdoch was killed with a shotgun. Alec Murdoch is known to own both types of weapons. Standing outside the front gate of the Murdoch estate more than a year after the murders, the grounds are overgrown, but it's so peaceful and quiet here in this rural area, standing in stark contrast to the chaos of June 7th, 2021. A two-lane road runs by the Murdoch property on Moselle Road. The area around it, woods and low-lying wetlands. The shooting deaths of Maggie and Paul Murdoch threw a spotlight on the rural counties that make up the 14th Judicial Circuit in South Carolina's Low Country, where the Murdoch name is well known. Everybody knows the Murdochs, you know, it's a, it's a household name that's been here forever. For 87 consecutive years, three generations of Murdochs served as the solicitor, which, like a district attorney, is the area's top prosecutor. But Alec broke with the family tradition and stayed in private practice instead of pursuing a career of public service. When you have a, a family that is so powerful and has so much influence, it's it's easy to go off the rails a little bit. Alec Murdoch reportedly gave investigators an ironclad alibi, saying that he was here at his parents' home in Barnville, South Carolina, around the time of the murders, less than 13 miles from the crime scene. He's with his mother, who has uh, dementia, uh, about she has dementia. 20 minutes. Yeah, he was with her about 20 minutes from Moselle. Okay, so. He has an alibi, but his alibi witness, I don't think, would be able to testify. Murdoch's defense team is asking for a speedy trial and say that Alec had nothing to do with the deaths of his wife and son. Now, some new information tonight, and this could severely impact the case. 
Originally, what we were hearing from prosecutors from the uh, SLED was that the time of the murder was between 9 and 9.30. 9 p.m. and 9.30. Now prosecutors have a new timeline. It's a little bit larger. After 8.30, before 10.06. Now that includes the 9 to 9.30 time, but clearly expands the window of time. Big change. Seemed like they were really locked in, 9 to 9.30. They had some evidence that pointed that way, but now opening up that window to 8.30 and all the way to 10.06. Now, the defense claims that Alec Murdoch does have an alibi, but up until recently, we haven't had much insight into what that alibi will exactly be. But last week, HBO Max released a three-part docuseries about the Murdoch family entitled Low Country, the Murdoch Dynasty. And in the third episode, they take a look at Paul and Maggie's murders. And at one point, they even interview Jim Griffin, one of Murdoch's attorneys. Here's a look at what he had to say about the day of the murders. On that day, June the 7th, Alec comes home from work around 6.30 and met Paul. And he and Paul rode around the fields inspecting the property. They were just, you know, hanging out together. And then they met their mother and they had dinner. Now, Griffin went on to say that after dinner, Maggie left to run the dogs, and Paul left the house because he, quote, never stayed inside. He says Alec doesn't know where Paul went, but that he went to watch TV on the couch and then fell asleep. Here's what Griffin says happened when Alec woke up. And he woke up about 9 o'clock, and he wanted to go check on his mother. So he tries to call Maggie first, and she doesn't answer. And he tries to call Paul, and he doesn't answer. And he texts Maggie and says, I'll be right back. He leaves, and he is on his phone from 9.03 through 9.21. And 9.21, he calls his mother's house phone, asking the nursing aide to let him in. Griffin then says Alex stayed with his mom for about 20 minutes watching game shows. He also points out that the nurse's aide said Alec was very calm and seemed normal. Then Griffin detailed what Alex says happened when he arrived back home. And then he arrives back to Moselle a little bit after 10 o'clock. was still locked up and there had been no sign that either Paul or Maggie had come into the house. He got back in his car and drove down to the dog kennel. And that's where he discovers their bodies. So, I mean, this is unusual, right? You, you, you generally, before a big double murder trial, you don't have the defense laying out their case, uh, but they are. They say he's got an alibi, and it seems from listening to this alleged alibi that there may be ways to confirm some of this. You put that together with this expanded timeline of when the murder took place, according to prosecutors, where exactly are we right now? Let's bring in our think tank. Join us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor, law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling is with us, in Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Hi. Ann Bremner, and in Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland. Great to see everyone tonight. Michael, let me start with you. Um, murder in the low country, but Alec Murdoch's attorney in the docuseries laying out this alibi Bigger window of time now, prosecutors are alleging. What does this mean? Is this a sign of weakness for the prosecution, weakness for the defense? What do you think? Yeah, Benny, uh, typically any time prosecutors are trying to change the time frame 
what you have is some uh, expressed weakness, right? So it's, they will tell you like, hey, we don't have to prove a specific date. They will tell you we don't have to prove a specific time. But anytime prosecutors are trying to change the time frame when something happened, it means that they understand there's some potential weakness. You, and you couple that with the possibility of alibi evidence telephone calls, things that can be fully verified, right? And it lets you know that there might be some weakness in the prosecution's case. Now, I'll tell you, Vinny, and you and I talk about this all the time. I'm not a person, I'd like to try cases between the lines. It, but with the 12 jurors who are gonna be there inside the court, I don't like to try cases in the media. I don't like docu-series about a case. I certainly wouldn't like a docu-series about a case before I've tried the case. Um, yeah, maybe after I've finished it and won, I, I'm okay with it. But you know, uh, it, it, those things can be problematic because you might change your theory of the case and jurors, potential jurors are looking at that. And so you never want to lock yourself into a story as a defense attorney because you never know what you what will come out in trial, what you'll be able to argue, the things you'll be able to say. And so I find that problematic, but I do think the prosecutor changing the time frame uh, demonstrates that they understand there's some potential weakness in their case that's corroborated by substantial evidence uh, that can be documented and, 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 and that is solid. You know, and I think the, the key part of that expanding of the window is really, I think, going back to 830. Because at that point, Alex's alibi is, I was sleeping. That was nap time. I couldn't have committed the murder. I was taking a nap. So uh, to me, that is a, a, a crucial little window there, 8.30 to 9 o'clock. Yeah, and, but have the prosecutors ever heard of on or about, you know, on or about a certain day and time? <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, that's kind of the way to get around it. Why do you need to lock yourself into a time, you know, and then need to expand it? Because it's like, I agree with Michael. It makes them look weak if they're going to have to change, you know, their theory of what the time was. And the other thing is, with Speedy Trial with uh, Murdoch, I'm like, what are you running into? It's like that Oscar Wilde quote, why, did, why does one run so quickly to their own ruin? I mean, he's got some other trials stacked up, doesn't he? I mean, this is not the end of the road for him. This is just number one in terms of trials. So I'm not really sure why, what his strategy is. A, Speedy Trial, and B, coming out with this lawyer describing a very detailed alibi that it may have some holes in it. Darnell, I'm looking at the alibi, and, and, you know, I hear some witnesses, a nurse's aide, some phone records, all of that. I mean, you, you, you've got to be able to back it up in court, but I don't think a lawyer would make those allegations if they couldn't back them up. Uh, but I think the, the weak link might be nap time. <laughs> well, in terms of the, uh, the, the quote-unquote eyewitness that didn't see anything, but... Uh, a calm, cool Alex, um, they really don't have uh, an eyewitness. Uh, no one has an eyewitness. And so um, I agree with the panel. Um, when they say on or about, that's just giving them an opportunity to later on fit in uh, to that picture what they need to. They need that picture to be uh, wide enough to fit things in there. And they don't just don't, they don't know yet what they want to put in there. Um, but in terms of uh, 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 Alex leaving uh, his mother's house and going over to his house, um, uh, his lawyers who are painting this picture, I think, um, shouldn't really paint that picture um, so succinctly. I think they should leave the prosecution to their burden and let them paint the picture. They're, they're the ones who have the burden to paint. So defense lawyers who do too much painting is not, not, not good. I will tell you this, though. I guarantee you um, a good percentage of the folks in the low country subscribe to HBO Max so they could watch this program. All right. <laughs>